Welcome to this Legatum Institute video. My name is Tim Montgomery and today I'm joined by Lord Ashdown, Paddy Ashdown, former leader of Britain's Liberal Democrats. And uh, Paddy is here with us tonight as part of our Vision of Capitalism series, exploring why, particularly in Western advanced nations, capitalism isn't popular with large sections of electorates. Paddy, welcome to the Legatum Institute. What's your basic answer to that question? Why do so many people in the West now feel that capitalism isn't working for them, isn't working for their children, and in a generation or two, they no longer expect what their parents expected, that they will be, their own children will be better off? Well, there are many answers to the question, Tim. Of course, like any big questions, you can't answer it in one. But here's my take, for starters. We think we have an economic problem. Actually, we don't. What we have is a political problem. And if you look around, we know perfectly well what we have to do to survive and prosper in the modern, global, interdependent world. We have to be leaner, we have to be fitter, we have to um, spend less uh, on governments, we have to, more, have to have more liberal markets, we have to have a more equal society. We know what we need to do. What we can't do is persuade our people that that's the right way to go because they don't trust us any longer. You look at Greece as a classic, excessive example of this, but you can look at Britain too. I mean, what you find in Britain now is those with the simplistic answers, which you can be pretty certain, I am totally certain, are wrong. Many of them, even charlatans, are the ones who are winning the votes. Mm. Now, what does that tell you? It means that in a complex world, getting the kind of message we've got to get across to our people in ways that they understand it, so as to be able to make capitalism work. And by the way, beyond that, make the state work, is something we find it impossible to do. Uh, is there any country political movement around the world that you see as no. a model for the kind of no. new politics you would like to see? No, I mean, I can see some who have started from zero, as it were, and and and, and are doing better than we are. I mean, some people quote, for instance, Singapore, by the way, uh, not the kind of society I would ever ascribe to in terms not of... Not the most liberal society. No, exactly not. The, but the trick for us is having come from a liberal background, how mm. do we preserve liberalism whilst also create a successful economy? And the answer is no, because no country has yet faced up to the question, which is all our politics is based on the concept of the nation state as it was a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. The nation state as the monopoly institution by which we know our identity, conduct our government and conduct our relations with each other. And in fact, the world has moved now well beyond. I don't say the nation state isn't important, it always mm -hmm. will be, very important. But the reality of it is that in order to, uh, the nation state, you, you, you must look towards a new settlement of power uh, of which the nation state is only one and no political class that runs any of the advanced Western democracies has faced up to that fact yet. Mm -hmm. And so they haven't got a solution. And so our politics is failing. Mm -hmm. And so we look around us and we are um, quizzical and bewildered as to why decent men are not able to get across manifestly right ideas. The answer is, it's the wrong model. I mean, I think I'd go a little bit further and I think I'd say this to you. Wherever and whenever you see an economic institution, and let's call politics a kind of economics for the, for the sake of the argument, that whose business model does not take into account the new technologies, the matter shorthand for a very big thing. This a, whole a thing. theme you were ahead of your time on. In Indeed, I remember warning about it. Yeah. But whenever you see a business model that does not take into account the post-industrial revolution, the information revolution, you see an industry that's about to fail. By the way, in my view, your own industry is one of these because it's still based on the, the, the newspaper industry. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's still its economic middle is, model is still this whirring gargantuan in the in the cellar producing newsprint. Mm. No people are going to be looking at that in the future. But politics is there. Politics is the model for politics remains the model of the late 19th century. It's glory days. We won't change it, and that means that I mean that there are, there are sort of two rules of history. I think, you know, if politics doesn't change to avoid catastrophe, catastrophe will change politics. Mm. Um, and it looks to me more likely that we're going to go towards the second than the first. Isn't it the basic truth is that we are in advanced, you could call them mature yeah. systems now. Yeah. And you look at, say, this is a gross simplification, but you look at the left and it has this vested interest of public sector, 
welfare state. You look at the right, it has vested interests of older voters, people who already have property, mm. call them NIMBYs. And both parties, to different extents, have no longer motivated or begin with ideals, but they begin with looking after these vested interests that form the bedrock Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a very good idea. But I could put it to you another way. The politics of the past, the politics you know, from which was the cradle of our present system, was the politics of the masses. Um, and there were two theories about running the masses. One was the right theory. It has to be run by a hierarchical system mm -hmm. from the top. The other, in other words, the leaders are right, whatever the consequences. And the other was the socialist theory, which mm -hmm. is um, the mass is right. Uh, neither of those apply, because this is not the age of masses. It's the age of individuals, mm -hmm. and individual liberty and individual choice, and the expressions of freedom, of, of pluralism. And so both of these are, you know, tend towards being instrumentalized by their vested interest to want to preserve what they have. The right is better than the left because fundamentally the right in its more normal form of the Conservative Party will revert back to just being a good governance party, mm -hmm. whatever it takes to govern well. The left, I think, is, is lost. Uh, I mean, I put it to you this way, I think whatever you might think to be the difficult position the Liberal Democrats find themselves in with only eight MPs, uh, our position is infinitely better than Labour's. Uh, you know, Britain could not do without liberalism. It can do without socialism. What is the essential message then? You, you talk about the catastrophe. Well, I'll, give you, I'll give you a very simple message. I think the age, the, the parallel I would use for the age is 1832. In 1832, the brilliant politicians of the day came together to realize that they could not allow to continue to exist the terrible disjunction between the realities out there and political life. Mm. And we had the 1832 Great Reform Act, which fundamentally altered it. It brought back politics into conjunction with mm. people's experiences. The rest of Europe failed to do that, and the mm. consequence was the great conflagrations that set Europe ablaze in 1848, from one end of Europe to the other. And you think a similar alliance of uh, progressives, I think, is the expression that yeah, you use, is, is, from, is needed again? Yeah, but progressives can come from, from all sorts of places. Don't imagine the progressives are just the left. Progressives mm. are the people who are going to be thinking about how do we give form and force to community? Mm. How do we provide for effective government at the lower level? How do we put citizens in more in control? I mean, I can find almost as much fellow travelers, as it were, to this central idea, a rather bad phrase to use perhaps, um, to the central idea amongst the, amongst the right, the communitarian right, mm -hmm. um, and some even the libertarian right than I can amongst the old mm -hmm. socialist left. And, and in many ways, you know, I think the left has, the left has done what it did in Margaret Thatcher's day and is going to get the same outcome. It's resolved itself by its problems by retreating into a sort of indolent socialism that thinks mm. that the world is on a progressive curve and will always deliver to them, classically Mr. Miliband did at the last election. It's not. Um, and the truth about the left is that um, if socialism has no role and it has abandoned Blairism, with hate by the way, which mm. was an iteration of that which, which did work, um, what are they going to put in its place? And, and we'll get the answer to that, but I can't see anything emerging that comes anywhere close to it. Final question to you. What sort of, give us a taste of the kind of shock to the system that you think might produce the kind of democracy. Well, Is it compulsory you... voting? Is it devolution? No, 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 it's not about what? that. No, you, none of those things will work unless you have a framework for politics that makes it matter to people. I mean, all this idea that we'll you know, make it easier for people to cast postal votes or votes on the... This is nonsense. What mm. you have to do is make people feel connected to the business of politics that changes their lives. And there's only one way to do that, and that is to devolve power into communities, um, to make people responsible for the actions that they... Um, for the decisions that they take within their communities, my vision of the kind of future is, has three layers, a resettlement of power from the nation state. The nation state will remain the most powerful, mm -hmm. um, the, the mean, means by which we are governed and draw our identity, but not the only one, it'll be a pluralist as well. I think the nation state looks after those things which are essentially nationwide, that is your defense, your foreign affairs, your macroeconomics, your macro transport mm -hmm. if you like, all of those things which turn on the delivery of service to the citizen within a framework of entitlements can be left to the local communities to decide for themselves. And if one decides to have selective education and the other not, well, that's their entitlement. We'll soon discover who's right. And then I think, and this is where you and I would disagree, you must have a supranational element to this mm -hmm. because it is manifestly true that much of the power that alters people's lives is no longer held in Westminster any longer. Mm -hmm. It's actually held above Westminster. So mm -hmm. you must have some form that brings governability to that. Now, around that broad agenda, there's a lot of thinking to be done, but that's the broad agenda that I think makes sense of our politics. 
And by the way, with turning to your question, then politics would find a much more ready conjunction with industry, with capitalism, and with the social mores of our times. It is the disjunction between the way people run businesses, live their lives, um, live within a structure of morality, and the business of politics that is simply past, of which that age is, is, is long past. That's the disjunction that's damaging us. Do what I suggest, and I think we can bring those back into some kind of uh, on, on a conjunction again. Paddy Ashdown, thank you very much. And thank you very much for watching. If you'd like to know more about the Lagartham Institute and indeed about the Vision of Capitalism series in particular, please do go to our website, which is li.com. Thank you.